Welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. This is Carly Stevens Books for all things writing, publishing, and indie author life. And I have the distinct honor today to be talking to Jonathan Mayberry, um, who many of you have probably heard of. <laughs> um, Jonathan Mayberry is a New York Times bestselling author, five-time Bram Stoker Award winner, four-time Scribe Award winner, Ink Pot Award winner, comic book writer, executive producer, and writing teacher. He is the author of 50 novels, 150 short stories, 22 graphic novels, um, which is a topic I haven't had the chance to learn much about, but it sounds amazing and flipping through yours. It's uh, definitely something worth checking out if you're out there watching and, and you enjoy graphic novels. Um, 20 nonfiction books, and he has edited 24 anthologies. His Vampire Apocalypse book series, V Wars, was a Netflix original series. He writes horror, science fiction, epic fantasy, mystery, adventure, thrillers, and more. He is the president of the International Association of Media Tie-In Writers and the editor of Weird Tales magazine. So thank you so much for being here to talk about uh, zombies with me today. <laughs> Well, it's my pleasure to be here, Carly, and I always like talking about my life impaired fellow citizens. So, <laughs> I, I love it. I'm I'm vertically challenged. You know, they're life impaired. <laughs> we all have something, right? Yeah. Um. So before we really get into the nitty gritty of this topic, can you tell us about how you first got into writing? I mean, you you clearly have such uh, an impressive career up to this point. Where did it begin? Well, I've, I'm one of those people that always wanted to be a writer. Even mm -hmm. when I was a kid, before I could read and write, I was telling stories with toys. So I've always wanted to do that. Had day jobs. You know, I didn't become a full-time uh, writer until, I, until I was 48. But mm -hmm. um, I started out actually with the intention of becoming the intrepid reporter who would, you know, tear down the corrupt whatever. And, um, I, you know, I went to, I was in high school right after Watergate. So that, that kind of, we all wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein. So I went to school on a, on a journalism scholarship, studied journalism, moved into magazine feature writing and did that for 30 years uh, as a side gig. Um, uh, a lot of stuff on martial arts, a lot of stuff on my hobbies like skydiving and travel and, and all sorts of things. Um, my first nonfiction book, my first book ever published was actually a judo textbook that I wrote for a buddy who was teaching judo at Temple University. I was teaching women's self-defense, martial arts history and jiu-jitsu at Temple University he was teaching judo. So I wrote his textbook for him and, and textbooks for my classes. Um, and um, then it wasn't until the early 2000s that I, I, I kind of had the idea to get into fiction. I had written some nonfiction books on supernatural folklore, the, this folklore of supernatural predators around the world and throughout history. And um, I kept wanting to find novels out there that would use folkloric monsters and couldn't find them. So my wife said, stop bitching about it. Just write the damn thing. <laughs> so I gave it a shot and uh, it took me three and a half years to write my first novel. And I uh, was lucky enough to get an agent quickly. She sold it quickly and it won a Bram Stoker Award. Wow, so, your first? Uh, yeah. the uh, fiction won, novel. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I was actually up for two two awards for that year. I was up for Novel of the Year, which I lost to some cat named Stephen King. You may have heard of him. Um, you know, <laughs> he, has, he has some talent. He might make something of himself one of these days. But I lost to him by two votes. Um, and he pointed out to me that he has two voting sons who are voting members. So, you know, um, and uh, I but the one I won was best first novel. And uh, that as a validation of an experiment, you know, because I only thought I was going to write that book and be done as a validation for an experiment. It was pretty huge. So I just kept writing. And, and that book came out in 2006 and it's, to, you know, end of 2023. And I'm writing my 50th novel with six more sold that I haven't written yet. Um, so apparently the writing thing was what, uh, the fiction thing is what I should have been doing all along. And along the way, I also, you know, wrote sarcastic greeting cards, plays, and um, uh, just bun bunches and bunches of other, lots of short stories, comic books, and so on. It's, it's been wacky since I got into the fiction world. <laughs> it's a, it, it's a bit of a weird, wonderful place to be <laughs> in the, in the fiction world. Um, so I wanted to dig into um, zombies in particular, because uh, you, the way that I was introduced to you was through uh, um, your horror novels. You know, I had, I had known about those for, for several years and there's a lot of, a lot of zombies, a lot of vampires. Um, so I, I want to know, first of all, how would you define a zombie? And then we'll, we'll kind of get into kind of how, how to make a zombie story realistic but how would you define a zombie in the first place 
Well, it, uh, there's a little backstory that comes with this. The word zombie was never intended for this genre. When George Romero did Night of the Living Dead, he called them ghouls because that's what they are. They're flesh-eating creatures. It wasn't until the movie, uh, his movies, the first two, began uh, being distributed through Europe, the Italian film directors hung the word zombie on it, and no one has been able to shake it since. Hmm. True zombies are not what we write about. We write about flesh-eating ghouls, either living dead or mad people who, you know, crazy people who eat flesh. Real zombies are part of the, the religion of voodoo, which is a very positive religion, you know, uh, and there are, you know, of course, every religion has its negative side, and there were uh, people, uh, magic users within the, the culture, or at least pretended to be, who, you know, used a chemical con uh, compound called, uh, well, basically it's tetrodotoxin. It's a neurotoxin and a couple of things that put somebody in a suggestive state and they were used to slave labor. That was the original zombie. And there were all zombie movies up until, you know, all through the 30s and 40s. But what Romero did is what we now call zombies, the flesh eating monster. Mm -hmm. And um, so by his de definition, and, and Romero was a very good friend of mine, by his definition, it is a corpse raised from the dead by whatever means, whether it is supernatural or science fiction, you know, some science thing, like as in his stuff, that for whatever reason feeds on the uh, on the flesh of the living. Um, and because his version is an entirely fictional construct, it allows everyone who has come after him to tweak the model. Um, you know, my Rotten Ruin series, which is my biggest selling um, uh, series because it's required re reading in 8,000 schools, which still freaks me out, um, that, that uses the slow shuffling zombie. The faster zombies are, um, depending on who you talk to, I was, you know, Max Brooks, who did World War Z, he and I are buddies. Mm -hmm. and his, the zombies in his uh, book are slow. The zombies in the movie are fast because fast zombies are scarier in the movies than slow zombies are. So, uh, but they're still, in, in his stories, they're kind of a, there's kind of a discussion as to whether the zombies are dead or whether they're humans so badly infected, they, they no longer have personalities. And um, funny, funnily enough, Romero created that subgenre too. He did a movie called The Crazies. A, a bioweapon gets out and turns everybody homicidal. Uh, it was remade, it was done in 72, I think, and it was remade um about 15 years ago with timothy oliphant and it. it's great both versions are great uh 28 days later is, is a riff off of the crazies whereas night of the living uh, any, any like walking dead and so on are a riff off of um uh the original night of the living dead so it all comes from from romero it starts with him he's the godfather of the living dead oh, and i i subscribe <laughs> to the if they're uh well actually there's one one other thing about the zombie this is something uh, I, I asked Romero and he confirmed for me. He called them living dead. They were not dead because if they're dead, um, there would be no respiration and zombies moan. There would be no uh, uh, circulation. And we know in certain stories, zombies bleed. And there would be no ability to stand up, walk, bite, swallow, whatever, without some function of the motor cortex and the uh, cranial nerves. So he said, they are not living. They're not dead. It's a third state of existence. They are mostly dead, but they're a little bit alive. They are living dead. And so that is that is my favorite definition. They are living dead. They're in this new state of existence. So kind of a, a Miracle Max state of <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the mostly dead. Yeah, I was wondering because because I have heard a couple conflicting definitions. You know, there is the the was dead and now is raised in this kind of semi-dead state and then the people who are infected you know I, I was thinking about um the v wars show like it's it, people are infected to become you know they they want to consume you know human you know at least human blood and i was like but those are but those are vampires not zombies so yeah. so it sounds like there are just a couple of different uh, models that you can work from and there's not there's not some early text that absolutely says one is a zombie and one's not it's just uh, yeah i mean the, the zombies because they are fictional like if we were all writing about the haitian zombies we'd have to stick to essentially the rules of that religion and that culture mm -hmm. but because romero actually romero didn't even start to do a, zo a zombie film he tried to get the rights to i am legend which is a vampire apocalypse novel uh if any, most people have seen the movies but they should read the books Look, brilliant book I've heard it's excellent yeah it is and it's a short book and you know it, it's it's the 
template for so many apocalyptic stories that have happened since and infection stories. Um, and uh, in that, you have two different types of zombie uh, vampires. You have a kind of a thinking one, which begin a new culture, and then you have the completely mindless one whose whose natural death caused damage to the brain. The thinking ones kind of evolved from the sick, the viral state into this new state of existence. And they were all attacking a house, and this guy's locked in his house, and you have these pale, mindless creatures trying to break in. And Romero could not get the rights to that because they were tied up, you know, with another film company. So he just borrowed the concept and built, changed them to ghouls mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, created a genre that is, it is massive right now. But everybody does the different styles. I mean, if you look at Warm Bodies by Isaac Marion, the, the, the zombies there are, um, they have some cognition and the, the infection of love cures them of being zombies, which is neat. You have Mike Carey's uh, Girl with All the Gifts, a brilliant book and a criminally underappreciated movie. Uh, Glenn Close started it, where it's um, an alien fungus. You have The Last of Us, the game, which is a mycotoxin. Um, and, uh, you know, you have all these different, you have The uh, the Rising by Brian Keene, which are demonic possession zombies. So it's a model you, that is infinitely elastic. So creators can do anything they want with it. There are no zombie rules. Even Romero, by the way, the zombie rules, every single movie, the zombies are different. In the second one, um, they are there's the trace memories in there the third one the zombies uh, learns how to use a gun and speaks you know above the zombie um then in the fourth one uh, they lead an assault on the city because they they've unified so he was evolving his zombies and most people forget that hmm. they think they only look at night of living dead and they think that's the zombie no no he was evolving them he changed them in every story so that's kind of a, a perfect segue clearly you've you've done your zombie research um, not only fictionally, but uh, I know that you you mentioned when uh, I met you at at the Twenty Books Vegas uh, rave event mm -hmm. that you'd done some more nonfiction style research on <laughs> on zombies as well, which I just thought was was the best the best thing. Um, so you interviewed different uh, kinds of people about zombies. What just to kind of open things up? What was something that surprised you as you were doing uh this more uh not you know non non-fiction research on zombies well when doing zombie csu the forensic science of the living dead i interviewed 250 experts in fields of every kind pathologists police uh bite mark experts like a forensic odontologists or bite mark experts mm -hmm. emts clergy the press military and what amazed me is every single person i talked to had already given it thought based on what they do for a living Cops, I mean, if you if you ever around a bunch of cops who have seen the movie 28 Weeks Later, the sequel to 28 Days Later, they turn red in the face and get angry because the snipers in that acted against all policy. They're up in elevated shooting positions with, with spotters, and then they go down to the street where they're <laughs> overwhelmed and killed. You know, it's, there's no sense to it. So hmm. I actually had a SWAT team offer to show me how they would reclaim the street from zombies. So I went to a police department that had this, this you know, combat thing set up. They had pepper poppers, which are these metal outlines that pop up. If it's a little girl with a puppy, you don't shoot it. If it's a guy holding a bomb, you do. But they put like gray faces, like, like little cardboard things over some of them. So maybe the little girl was a zombie. And they did first from elevated shooting positions and then in a, a running fight to show me how they would, you know, uh, reclaim the street. It was fascinating. That, talk, that is yeah, I talked to epidemiologists and parasitologists, uh, hoping to come up with something that was, you know, like a medical understanding of how a zombie might exist. Mm -hmm. I was hoping to get maybe 25% doable. They got me up to 70% doable. Um, luckily, that last 30%, we, we, you know, we, we can't do. And it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. So what, I, what did that, what did that look like? Um, well, they all said, every expert I talked to said parasites. Mm -hmm. Um, because a virus can't do it. A virus can't s survive in a host that is compromised, that is dead or dying. Uh, but a parasite can. Mm -hmm. So, and there are parasites that, that in, like the green jewel wasp and others, that hijack the uh, their their victim, plant their eggs, and it rewires their their central nervous system, so that the uh, the victim carrying the eggs will fiercely defend the eggs from any other predator, including their own kind. So they become like zombie ants, zombie grasshoppers, zombie whatever, because okay, they're, they're right. I've I've heard of those. I've seen, yeah. I've seen pictures. 
Yeah, and I mean, that's the great basis for it. So I actually did a book, um, Dead of Night. Uh, it's part of a four book series where I give the whole science of it. You know, I really go deep into the science and how it can be tweaked with bioweapons. Mm -hmm. um, and there are also some things that explain the, the lower metabolic rate of a zombie. There are ground squirrels that freeze solid every winter and then thaw completely healthy. And there are frogs that do the same thing. So there is hibernative, uh, there are hibernative genes in the DNA of certain animals. Well, it can, and there are also monks that can lower their metabolism down to about 10%, you know, of what if you, just during meditation. Mm -hmm. Well, if you take all that and find out how it's done within the monks and, and the animals, you can then bioengineer with using the CRISPR gene editing technology or other forms of molecular biology. Eventually, they can give those traits to human beings. Um, like I know they're doing research right now with the military, like you get a soldier who's injured far, far away from, from a, a military hospital. They are working on ways to completely exsanguinate, meaning remove all the blood and flash freeze them and then revive. So essentially they are dead. And then, but they're, they're frozen so fast. And with some chemicals that prevent the, uh, the brain tissue from being destroyed and then revive them, that's what they're working on. So they can be then transported to a hospital and revived, you know, without the damage doing anything. And that, that sounds good for the soldier- Insane! Look, I'm I'm literally wearing an Empire Strikes Back yeah. <laughs> sweater to the. I mean, that, that's that's Han Solo. That's the, the yeah, cryo yeah, that, freeze. That, that, that is, and, and they're actually doing. They're they're attempting to do this on on still living human beings with. A, well, they're experimenting their own success. Yes, they're experimenting with dogs, which I hate the fact of, but um, and weirdly, it's the the university that's doing this is in Pittsburgh, like. Of all places, the birthplace of the zombie movies, <laughs> maybe not the best fertile ground for it, I don't know, but um, they've already been able to revive dogs. Uh, so they're going to be able to do that with people. And there are so many ways that could be, that could go wrong, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was doing research for this, I found out all this crazy stuff out there. And this is what science is working on. They have some, you know, the science has um, like a, a, a good purpose for some of it, you know, saving soldiers and, you know, plane crash victims that need to be transferred or whatever. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, contacts within the Department of Defense and DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration, basically the science geeks that create stuff for, for the military. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they want to use that stuff for their own ends. And I don't for a minute believe it's entirely altruistic. Right. There, there's so much of a temptation, even if it's fairly innocent to just do things that you can do because you can do them and and worry about the the potential ethical ramifications later that's that's the the line from jurassic park we we, we try so we spend so much time trying to do it we, we we don't pause to think whether we should right right so it sounds like from all of these different um arenas and perspectives that that there's the majority of the distance between where we think we are currently and some kind of fictional zombie apocalypse, we can get almost all the way to that that thin gap in between. Yeah. I mean, am I am I, am yeah, I understanding you correctly? Especially since the development of the CRISPR gene editing technology. I mean, that was invented invented um, twelve years ago, I think it is. To, uh, to be able to cure things like Tay-Sachs and sickle cell and other diseases. And they will actually be able to cure those diseases. But it, the, it, but unfortunately, they've allowed it to be open sourced, which means anybody can use it. So what prevents somebody from coming in doing designer people? Well, that's the eugenics program that we all fought against. You know, I mean, that was the, the Nazi master race program. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, Khan on Star Trek, that's the eugenics war, you know. We've, you know, science fiction writers, we've been writing cautionary tales about this stuff for a long time, but now the tech, the science is here. We can mm. do it. Um, and I, you know, what's preventing someone from doing it their own way, you know, or for their own purposes to create a, uh, like a white master race, which, you know, a lot of folks wanted, you know, the Nazis and others even had a lot of supporters in the United States and England prior to World War II. Um, you know, they say, well, we can make somebody who doesn't have diseases and so on that will look like we want them to look, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed, whatever. And, um, you know, that that's great if it's natural. It's not so great if it's forced. And um, 
So that also opens up the door for radical advances in bioweapons technology. Hmm. And that's scary as hell. Hmm. So as you were doing all of, you know, really diving into the actual scenarios of biology and the military and, and all these different arenas, did it highlight any mistakes that you see people making in the in zombie movies or books or well, different kinds of media just like kind of things yes. that would never happen um main thing is in the real world professionals are competent and in a lot of zombie movies they're not like emt showing up you know if if, if some somebody is acting crazy and biting the first thing i do is restrain them and then put a spit hood on them so they can't bite um, police carry spit hoods. They would put that on. I put it in in uh, Dead of Night because I was so tired of not seeing that practical step. They would cuff. Mm -hmm. Also, police know how to uh, they you know well trained police know how to arrest somebody without physically harming them and also without being harmed by them. I used to teach this to police you know departments. We used to call it cop safe how to arrest somebody without hurting them and to stay on the lowest rung of the force continuum. Mm -hmm. It's physics, physiology, and anatomy, you know, you, you can do it. Um, but cops act, act stupidly in the movies, uh, EMTs act stupidly in the movies. EMTs are sharp as hell. And they're used to dealing with, uh, you know, people who are being, you know, uh, whacked out of their heads on drugs or whatever. They're used to dealing with that level of extre extreme behavior. So of course, they're going to be able to, to control a zombie. Um, so I, I hate that sort of stuff. Also, a couple of things in the movies and TV, everybody seems to be able to get a headshot. Hmm. Um, I, you know, I used to be a bodyguard. I used to carry a gun and I've been through gun ranges and getting a headshots really, really tough. Um, so when I was working with the police that time, they were showing me, they, they had two really good, uh, you know, uh, cops who were really good with handguns and they had them run a course at speed and, you know, just basically doing the targets, getting headshots and, Really top-notch cops were getting one out of 12 headshots. Hmm. Walking dead, you get somebody who picks up the gun for the first time. He's, you know, he's Annie Oakley. He's killing everybody, you know. You're, you're not in it for the drama, the ex no, explosion. No. <laughs> uh, and another thing, well, I hate to pick on Walking Dead, but it's been around for so long. Go, go for it. I'm, you're, you've, you've paid um, your dues, you know. You, you've got a couple book on the subject. Yeah, a couple things about that. Um, first off, the level of hygiene demonstrated by characters who have been in the zombie apocalypse for like seven or eight years in the series if if it's a serum transfer disease which they have established it is you know spit you know biting someone the smallest scratch on them when they get covered with zombie blood they are infected and they cover themselves with zombie blood in you know in zombie gore if and they're living rough and in the wild you know they've got cuts on them um they get splashed in the face eyes nose mouth are all you know areas where any viral thing will mm. infect us, and yet it makes it it's easy writing, some might call it lazy writing, to to allow them to do that without getting infected. I think it's more of a challenge, uh, and therefore more of a creative uh, innovation is to have them have consequences from that sort of thing. Mm. Also, ten, you know, ten years in, eleven years into Walking Dead, nobody's wearing body armor, really. Um, I mean, I, I would wear body armor all the time. When I did Rot and Ruin, I, one of the things I invented was carpet coats. You can't bite through carpet. You know, you <laughs> couldn't do it. And a zombie with rotting dental lig ligatures is not, are not going to be able to bite through carpet. So why not make coats out of carpet with, you know, uh, it's just practical. Hmm. Um, it, there, there, there are, oh God, there, I mean, it's a long, long list of things. People shooting a zombie in the head or stabbing a zombie in the head. The brain's this big, right? The motor cortex is about that big and it's right up here. And unless you get that, you're not going to stop a zombie because all the other parts of the brain mm -hmm. have nothing to do with their ability to move around or bite. So, and a lot of that's dead already, probably. Yeah. Or, or diminished, whichever cause. You know, greatly diminished. So again, in dead of night, one of the, because, and I wrote a lot of the stuff into dead of night because I was frustrated with what I'm seeing elsewhere. So I had a cop fighting a zombie for the first time without realizing what it is, a couple of headshots and the thing is still attacking. Maybe some warped, you know, like stroke-like apparent symptoms because of nerve damage, but it wasn't until a shot hits the motor cortex that it actually dies or the brainstem. Mm -hmm. 
So what I don't like are stupid characters do, doing things stupidly and yet surviving hmm. or doing things stupidly and causing everyone else to die. And I'll buy it. One other thing, and I, I busted George Romero for this pretty hard. I, have, um, uh, I said that, um, you know, at the end of a couple of your films, especially like uh, uh, Dawn of the Dead, you had uh, two people fly away and we're presuming they're going to be the Adam and Eve of the new human race. Well, that's a mighty shallow gene pool. A couple generations, you're going to have like children with three eyes and flippers. Um, you need about 5,000 members of a species to perpetuate it safely with, with you know, healthy DNA. And, you know, that's an easy thing to find out. Hmm. So why aren't those zombie stories about community building in a, in a safer, smarter way? It creates its own dramatic challenges. It's not like it cancels out the threat. It just makes you go deeper to build the threat. So I don't like stupid characters and I don't like lazy writing. So That's you want to, you want to see people working at their actual potential and dealing with actual consequences when yeah. like, things go wrong. I mean, that's, that is just, I think that is just good, yeah. <laughs> good writing, even if the temptation is to make things a little easier. Yeah. And, and also like, like with, um, you know, the zombie stories, they try to get out of town and find somewhere safe. They never go to the, the right places. Like they go to a pharmacy every or a supermarket. Everybody goes to a pharmacy and supermarket. Go to a uh, like a food distribution warehouse. Look one up. You, you the satellites are not going away anytime soon. Look one up. Where's it? They are big block buildings with no windows, truck mm -hmm. bays, and lockable doors with their own generator and their own their own uh, backup generators with, with their own fuel. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have enough food to feed a couple of hundred people for months. So go out and find a couple of hundred people. And when you get them, like in, in a lot of the stories, you have one person who knows how to do a little first aid. Why doesn't that person teach every single person there about first aid? You have a couple of people who can shoot. Why are they not teaching them how to shoot correctly? Why mm -hmm. is there no sharing of knowledge? And also only one episode of Walking Dead touched on this. And uh, I thought they were going to go w deeper, but they didn't. If you survive the day, and you find a safe place, like I say, a food distribution warehouse, and you're, you're going to be there safe for weeks and weeks. What's getting you through all those hours of safety? How are you surviving emotionally and mentally? And, and as a group, find out who in the group who can tell a story, who can play an instrument, who can sing. Find out someone who can do art. Mm -hmm. Get those things there because that connects a culture, people within a culture, and they remember what they're fighting for. Mm -hmm. The stories where you have an isolationist, like a prepper sort of person, Surviving, I can guarantee you within two years, he's putting a gun in his mouth because there is nothing to live for. Hmm. Surviving is not enough. Surviving is temporary. Survival on a long term is, is uh, it requires other people and requires culture. Because otherwise, why are you surviving? To what point are you, you know, if you're just going to live alone in a cave and, and chase off, you know, other people who are wandering, you're chasing off any potential for you to have meaningful interactions with people and you're going to kill them and eventually you're going to kill yourself hmm. so it has to be more than physical survival you have to consider even as a even as a fiction writer all those different aspects of yeah. of humanity i mean that that is absolutely that is absolutely true i just when i when i think about a zombie story it seems like one person is is enough you know it's it's almost like the the shipwrecked person who's just trying to get to the next day until there's the possibility of finding right. someone else but that's that's a great point yeah, yeah. i mean survival shipwreck survival or somebody who, who just escapes and is hiding out somewhere there's immediate survival which of course sometimes is isolated you have to get you have to stay safe in order to then get balance and then look for other people but a lot of the writers stop at the point where they're safe as if mm -hmm. that's the end of the story that is the beginning of the story mm -hmm. there is so much more to tell and uh, many, many writers, not all, many writers don't bother looking deeper. They don't do their research. Talk mm -hmm. to experts. Find out. And it's because of, of doing the research on Zombie CSU that I wrote my first zombie novel, which was um, Patient Zero, the first of my Joe Ledger thriller series. Mm -hmm. Spec Ops against uh, zombies created by a prion disease. Um, it gave the science of it. You know, From then, I went on to write Rotten Ruin because I, I, I kept thinking of like I, I, my introduction to zombies was actually I snuck into the movie theater at age ten to see the world premiere of Night of the Living Dead, 
So I have been thinking about this for a very long time. Rotten Ruin takes place 14 years after a zombie apocalypse. People growing up in gated communities that are protected mm. from anything else is the, is the wasteland. And that, that book's being made into a movie right now, by the way, by Alcon Entertainment. Um, so what would life be if you're growing up in a post-zombie apocalypse world? Mm. You know, what jobs exist only in that world? What, what, what are the, the safety precautions? What are the viewpoints of the people who survived as opposed to the people who were born after? Mm. You know? A lot of little explorations of culture, of psychological cause and effect, and uh, community building and so on. And I, I had a lot of fun building that sort of a world. And um, there are other writers who, who do who do well with it. Um, Mike Carey, you know, Grow Well the Gifts, did a great job with his and a few others. But um, I think too much of the zombie uh, fiction, whether in, in any form, is all about the outbreak and not about... Mm post-apocalypse that's the apocalypse post-apocalyptic should not be an example of a bunch of people being led by one charismatic leader and then making a series of of increasingly stupid choices in order to amp up the drama i i find that tiresome as hell <laughs> so is there any other i mean you've already given a, a... Uh, some incredible advice to people who are interested in breaking into the zombie horror genre, but is there any other advice that you would give someone who is just starting that journey? Maybe they don't have sure. that much, you know, background in history um, of thinking about it as thoroughly as you have. What would you recommend to somebody uh, like that? Find one person with an interesting profession that may in some way be affected by zombies. EMTs were a great place to start cops, um, nurses, hmm. openly overlooked, except in the Zack Snyder remake of Dawn of the Dead. Main character was a nurse. Hmm. Um, and uh, talk to them and research them about, and give them different scenarios like, okay, you know, you have a teacher trying to protect a group of kids in a school. Hmm. Well, what resources are in the school? Ask if you can visit the school and look at the hallways, at the rooms and see, how can it be barricaded? How can it be, you know, what, what is there that could be a potential weapon? What are the pro the policies and protocols within the school that would that that the teacher would follow and maintain a sense of authority to keep the kids protected? They um they there was a show, was it freakish or something like that? Um, where a bunch of kids were trapped in a school. And um, I think it was called Freakish. But they were all trying to survive. And you know, some of the decisions they made were really, really good. And some were convenient tools by a screenwriter who didn't want to bother asking somebody who ever worked in a school. Hmm. You can tell the episodes that were written by someone who's doing research and those who did, who weren't. And I'm a, I'm a research junkie. Hmm. And everyone will talk to you. You, you. you can go do ride-alongs with cops, with EMTs. Just ask. Say hmm. you, uh, you know, you're writing a zombie book and, and you want to get accurately what they would do they will tell you and that will make your story stand out from all the people who don't mm -hmm. bother to research and uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that has not been touched on because not enough newbie writers and newbie it's open to newbie writers not enough of them have bothered to do the research and the ones who do are the ones who have a career the ones that their, their, their books will shine hmm. that is some fantastic research and i've found that even in a, in a small way through this channel and the people that I've gotten to talk to writers and, and other professionals, most people do say yes, you know, if you want to talk to them about something specific. Yeah. So yeah, I would, I would second that just shoot your shot. What's the, what's the worst that can happen? They say no, and you move on to somebody else. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've been to, aut I've sat on autopsies. I've been ERs. I've, I've done ride-alongs with EMTs, forensic collection units, and mm -hmm. uh, cops. I've, I've been out on a nuclear submarine. Um, you know, I met, met someone who happened to be an admiral. and <laughs> Sounds yes. terrifying. And, I don't want to be in a nuclear submarine. <laughs> but that, I, be, I bet it was fascinating, though. Gosh. And, and, you know, I'm 6'4", and I was very comfortable in, the, in it. Oh. An old old hunter-killer submarine, not so much. They're, they're this big. Nuclear submarines are gigantic. They're bigger than a World War II destroyer. Um, so it's plenty. Yeah, they're, they're gigantic. Whoa. Uh -huh. That is not my... Well, anyway, I guess that's a topic for another day. And yeah. that's not how I picture submarines. I picture them all claustrophobic. Right. And and I it changed my opinion of them. So when I was able to write about it, I was able to write about it more accurately. Hmm. Uh, it, it, talk to an expert. They they love to tell you the truth because they they hate seeing what they do 
misrepresented in popular culture. S forensic uh, uh, investigators are the best because they hate what's called the CSI effect. Mm. It, it, people think CSI is that fast. They think the CSI techs are the ones that, uh, arresting criminals. No, they're not. Uh, ever, like right. ever in the history of CSI, has has a forensic tech gone out and arrested somebody? Um, and and the actual science is more difficult and therefore more rewarding to explore in fiction than the versions they do on the shows, where it's they have to get it all wrapped up in an hour. And in a novel, you have time to see the frustrations and the problem solving. Mm -hmm. And that problem solving by someone who's an expert in it is something that we would never know as writers unless we're with that expert. And it, mm -hmm. it allows us to have a much richer story to tell. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so one more one more question before my final question that I ask everybody. And it's since you have obviously given this an enormous amount of thought, you know, where you where you go, what you would do, what are who are some of the people that you would want to be on your zombie apocalypse team? If you could choose a couple people that you knew would survive with you. Okay, I need someone who can drive a truck that has a stick. I don't know how to drive a stick, and we need trucks because trucks will carry supplies and a truck will carry a lot of people. Okay. Um, I need someone who has basic construction skills. I don't even know which end of a hammer to hold because if I get in there, I don't want to nail boards crookedly across the wall, uh, the windows. I want to reinforce the place sensibly. I need somebody who knows first aid and who can teach all of us. I also need somebody who, who can cook from scratch because we're going to run out of stored supplies. And you know, I'm a city boy, so I, I don't know anything about that. So I need somebody who can do that. Now, I, my background is, you know, 60 years in martial arts. I can train people how to fight in an hour, uh, That the type of fight that we'd be doing. And um, I bring that to it. Um, so everybody would have a role. I would want someone who, um, rather than... A, you know, like a skilled fighter or black belt. I want someone who's done lacrosse or tennis or baseball because we're going to run out of bullets real fast. We need to hit with clubs. Somebody who's used like a, like a lacrosse player or a baseball player, they know how to put, the, the, they know how to do the torque safely so they don't damage their knees and their lower back and their muscle memory will help them accurately hit. So put a blunt instrument in their hand, they're going to be able to survive much longer than a guy who, who's going to run out of bullets quickly and who cannot get the motor cortex on the first shot because if you have to spend five shots doing it and you have a 15 round uh, magazine you're running out of bullets real fast right. a guy a guy with a um uh, a crowbar or a good length of black pipe is going to kill 40 zombies by the time this guy's the zombies finish eating that guy with the gun <laughs> um so it's people like that and then i would love to get somebody who who is a, a guitar player or, or some instrument because we are going to need to be able to relax because otherwise if we sustain a level of stress, we're going to reach emotional, emotional burnout like that. So that, that would be my crew. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew you'd have a good answer. That was, that was just ready to go. Um, so how can people find you and more about your work online? Well, I am everywhere online. Uh, and the only trick is spelling my last name, right? People want to spell it M A Y but it's M-A-B-E-R-R-Y. It is pronounced Mayberry, but it's M-A-B. Look for Jonathan Mayberry. I'm everywhere. I'm on you know, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter. I will not call it X. It's Twitter. Um, <laughs> threads and a whole bunch of other places. And I have a website, jonathanmayberry.com. And if anyone out listening to this is a writer on my website, there's a page. One of the pages is called Free Stuff for Writers. <laughs> and it's exactly that. It's dozens of downloadable PDFs query letters, how to write a synopsis. I think it's one of my oh. Captain America comic book scripts when I was writing for Marvel, you know, just so you can see all these different forms and, and share them with your writing friends and, you know, grab whatever you want. Also, every Thursday from uh, 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific time, adjust for your own time zone, I do an Ask Me Anything. And if people can hmm. ask about uh, my books or they can ask writing questions or whatever. You know, it's, it's literally Ask Me Anything. So that's how to find me. Okay. And I'll make sure that those links are all down below so that you can um, find them in all those different places. And I'm excited to take a look at those writing uh, freebies and, and see what's there on the website. It, I didn't see those when I was poking around actually, earlier. Actually, one, one thing that's really particularly useful, two things. One is how to write a synopsis and there are examples because in traditional publishing, they always want a synopsis along with and the novel. And synopses are the worst. They're just yeah. so, it, so it, it, They are the worst. And this, <laughs> this makes it a little easier. But also query letters. The query letter I have mm -hmm. up there, 
aside from the fact that I used it to sell, it has been tweaked by dozens of my agent and editor friends. So it is the exact kind of letter they want to see come across their desk. Mm. Use that as a template. Thank you so much for, for providing all of that. And especially for taking time out of your afternoon to talk to me, because this has just been a joy. It's been, it's well, all these things that I don't really spend my time thinking about, but it's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's been an honor to well, talk to you today. Also, you know, it's, it, I'm very happy with it because you ask really good questions. We ask the questions that get the right answers and they're not the standard rote questions. And I appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you very much. All right. So take a look at the links below to find um, Jonathan Mayberry and all of his incredible books. Like this video if you like it. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification button for more content like this. And I'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.